This is Dennis Jers. I'm about to introduce my digital storytelling class to Twine. Twine is a wonderful hypertext authoring tool that can get you started very quickly, but it's also very expandable and allows you to do in Twine everything that you can do in HTML or CSS. So if you are already an experienced coder of HTML or CSS or JavaScript or anything like that, uh, Twine will allow you to incorporate all those fancy features. Now, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to introduce some of the features of Twine. Well, I guess first I should say um, go to twinery.org. Uh, it is possible to use Twine online if you just want to play with it. I have downloaded the desktop version and I will be using the desktop version. But I'm going to go ahead and double click on this demo that I created uh, for uh, another purpose. And I just want to show you. These are some things that we can do in Twine. First of all, there's basic formatting. Uh, you can see, you know, large text and so forth. We have uh, uh, hyperlinks uh, that allow you to move around. And I will talk a little bit more about some more, a little bit more complex formatting. Here's how you can do things like bold and height, uh, things like that, and get lining, justifying text, and so forth. If you know how to use cascading style sheets, uh, it will be pretty easy to do your standard CSS style effects, and I'll show you how to do that. Here's an example of an embedded YouTube video, and here's just a picture from online that we can embed in a, a Twine document. So those are some uh, kind of basic features, but I also want to show you some more complex ones. This is a dynamic text. Uh, usually, when you click on a link, it takes you to another page, but when I click on this word add, watch what happens. We added some words at the end of the sentence. Now look in this blank area right here. If I click on the word dissertation, another line of text appears. Topic, another line of text appears. Meaning, another line of text appears. And that word meaning includes a link to the home page. So uh, here's another example. Uh, in this version, you saw each time I clicked on a link, we got a separate line. Uh, now, in a different way of doing it, and I'll show you how to do this. If I click on this word dissertation, uh, that text gets added at the end of the paragraph. Meaning is the third link in this sequence of three, and we're going to see more text added to the end of that sentence. And topic was the middle one. We're going to see another line of text appear between the word door and perhaps. So, uh, this technique would allow you to kind of pace yourself. You could uh, emulate the way filmmakers might start a scene with a distant shot of the exterior of a house, and then as the scene progresses, move to close-up shots of individual actors delivering lines. Well, in a similar way, you can do something like that with hypertext document by presenting some general text with links to click on that allow you to uh, see more detail. It's sort of you're controlling, you're allowing the reader to control the pace of the details being thrown at them. Now, uh, usually clicking on a link takes you to another page. Watch this. When I click on the word change, you want to link, sometimes you want to link to change your text. Ooh, it changed to the word refine. Now I'm going to do this, I'm going to nest it in an interesting way. Links can nest in complex ways. Clicking on the word nest introduces another line that has a link to the word subtle. This effect is more subtle than a screen refresh. Click on the word subtle and it becomes engaging. More engaging than a screen refresh. More intimate than a screen refresh. I click on the word intimate and it sends me to advanced dynamic text. Well, you could easily imagine uh, an emotional exchange with a character or a hypertext poem in which clicking on links actually changes the words. When we take a look at this advanced dynamic text, this demonstrates mouse over replace and mouse out replace macros. Macro is like a, you know, a short coding shortcut. So um, uh, this grove is silent. Oh, I moused over the word silent and it changed to the word cursed. Okay, so let's imagine that this is the hypertext I'm looking at, and I'm scanning, looking for possibilities to interact. A man, his lips parched, stands in a lake of clear water. Ooh, stands in a suddenly barren lake bed. And I mouse out, and it's now a tantalizing lake. But when I mouse back over it, there is no further change. 
Um, I just did a really quick change there, but anyway, some more extra changes, and I'll I'll walk you through exactly what I did and uh, uh, show you that code in in a couple minutes. But if you are more interested in this, uh, the Twine Two Manual Online has lots of information about uh, these coding shortcut macros. Uh, we're just going to together uh, recreate uh, this um, uh, document in a new web. So let me bring us there. I'm going in another window. I'm calling up some notes. Okay. So I'm going to create a new story and we'll call this twine introduction. And here we are with an untitled passage. I'm going to rename this untitled passage home. And I'm going to add a title. I'm going to call it Introduction to Twine 2.0. Okay, Twine can be found at twinery.org. And we'll get some content. So let's do, we'll start with um, hypertext. We'll do formatting and style, dynamic text, and conditional text. All right, so when we take a look at this, uh, and by the way, um, double click on it to get into edit. When you're finished, there's actually no save button. You just click the, the X, it's automatically saved. And then you play your game. And here we have a nicely formatted page. Uh, well, it's kind of blandly formatting page. So let's give it a little formatting. Uh, I'm going to use a hashtag. A single hashtag makes a largest size heading. And uh, let's get some, let's format a bulleted list. Okay, very simple. And let's play it and see the results. And now we see nice big opening title and a nicely formatted bulleted list. And we'll go back in here and uh, a lot of extra space between the contents and the bulleted list. So let's take a look at that. Yeah, just removed a blank line and that's a little bit better formatted. Okay, so let's create our first hyperlink. Hyperlinks are actually very easy to create in Twine. All you have to do is I'm going to put two square brackets around this word hypertext. And now another passage appears. We click play. I click hypertext and there we go. I can use this go back button. Now, if you're creating a, a complex story, you know, a survival horror story or a mystery story or something like that, you probably would not want your uh, reader to be able to use the undo button to sort of, you know, take back any uh, action that they didn't immediately like. Um, I, later, I can show you how to disable the uh, undo uh, and redo buttons, but for now, we'll, we'll leave it there. So let's go into the hypertext document. I'm going to edit it, and uh, we'll say So, for instance, if I want to send the player home, we already have a page called home. And now, when we play this document, we see we have a two-way link that takes us back and forth between the two different passages that we already have in our site. And that's pretty simple stuff. Let's now talk about formatting. You know what, there's one more thing I'm going to do. I'm going to talk about on the um, hypertext page. Uh, on the hypertext page, see this thing called home? Let's just create another link, um, call it test page. And test page is automatically created. When we go there, there's, you know, there's nothing there. Let's call it, this is my test page. 
And now when I go here, you can see we have this stuff up here. Every passage needs to have text up there. That's the passage's name. Not every passage needs a headline. I don't actually need, let's go to hypertext test page. I don't actually need something that says this is my test page. This page, for instance, uh, doesn't have a, a headline at all. So, um, and if I call this cheese factory, uh, the title of the passage and what appears here have nothing to do with one another. Uh, so if I want to change this and call it advanced hypertext, this is actually pretty cool. Remember before this just said test passage? Now it says advanced hypertext. Hmm. Well, let's go over here. And if we called it advanced hypertext page, uh -huh. uh, all the links in this Twine web will um, uh, change automatically. But if I change it here, call it advanced hypertext. Well, what it did was it created another passage called advanced hypertext because this one is actually called advanced hypertext page. I'm going to get rid of that one. Let's delete it by using the trash can icon. So let's bring this here. I want to show you a little bit more about hyperlinks. I will. All right, so let's do a little bit more advanced hypertext. Let's say one link home, that's easy. What if you want to link to a mystery door that leads somewhere? We can do mystery door. Yeah, we could link it that way. It's called mystery door. But what if we really want the mystery door to take you to, you know, a secret garden? Well, now it's not all that secret or mysterious if it tells you exactly what the link is. But we can do this. See how that works. So you found the secret garden. Now let's go back to this advanced hyperlink page. Now we could keep hitting play and then it would take us to hypertext and then advanced hypertext and here's the mystery door. Instead I'm going to use, I'm going to mouse over this passage and use this little debug icon. We're going to start here and we're going to go right to this page uh, in the debug view. And now when I click on mystery door, it says you found the secret garden. So what's useful about that is uh, you can change this text. No way. I can be more creative about this without change, without worrying about um, having to change that. So it just gives you a little bit more control over uh, the differences between the text that your player sees and the text that uh, tells Twine which uh, passage should be loaded next. So. Um, that will make, I think, a little bit more sense in the future when you have a much more complex project. And I'll, I'll get you there in a little bit before the end of the tutorial. Okay, so back to back to these examples. Let's uh, I'm just, I'm just going to move my secret garden up here out of the way a little bit. I'm going to organize things a little bit. I'll start with my home over here, uh, my hypertext. I've got an advanced hypertext link and I've got a secret garden link. I'm going to do my next one. I'm going to create a passage 
called formatting. And I'm going to put that one right here. There's no right or wrong way to do this. I just like uh, arranging things out kind of neatly so I can tell at a glance where I am. Okay, so for formatting, I can get some quick tips by I'm going to select this text, delete it all, and you can see here's some tricks for how to get bold, italic, superscript, strike through, and here's uh, the HTML tag uh, paragraph. All those things work, and uh, so let's just get a couple things. We'll start off with we'll start off with formatting tips. And if I view this document, all it says is format. That's a little boring. So let's try. You know, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and create a big fancy title. And there, now the text is much larger. So um, I can do contents and So we'll just run that for a second so you can see what's going on. Okay, we've got our context bold. Let's make this italic superscript and redacted. Italics is pretty easy. Superscript also makes sense. That's a little carrot. Superscript, there we go. And redacted, if you just wanted to play with your reader and make some text a little bit harder to view, you know, maybe a password or something like that, or maybe a character is whispering or you're, something like that. Uh, you can see the text is still there. It's just much harder to read. So you're kind of hiding it in plain sight. So those are some uh, traditional formatting techniques. We can also add a horizontal line pretty easily by typing the minus sign three times. And if you want, right justified text, center text or left justify text. Here's what you do. Before the text, we're going to use two equals sign and a bracket. That makes a little arrow. For left, it's pretty obvious what you do there. And for centered, it's actually kind of cute. Two little arrows looking at each other. So with that, with those formatting techniques, I've changed the formatting. Now let's take a look and see how that works. And there we have a little bit of basic formatting that shows you what's going on. Now, if you are at all familiar with HTML and CSS, you'll know what style sheets are. And if you're not familiar with style sheets, I'll show you what they can do. And I'll just give you a really brief introduction to style sheets. I want to bring my style thing over here. And So basically, anything you can do in HTML or CSS, you can also do in Twine. One of the things we can do in CSS is called the div tag. I just type this, this structure, this is a tag, open angle bracket, the word div, close angle bracket, and then some text in here, and then open angle bracket, this slash, and then div again, and a close angle bracket. This allows me to do something unusual. You know how to do it, you can format this text, you can kind of target that text and format it in a different ways. Okay, so when you look at it this way, nothing seems to be all that special, but I'm going to go in here and I'm going to show you uh, if you do style equals and then quotation marks, we can put some special formatting commands in here. I'm going to set the background to be yellow, and we'll see what that looks like. And predictably, we have that yellow background. 
If you want to learn more about how to use formatting techniques to change the color of your text and the alignment of your text and so forth, uh, any online tutorial will help you figure out how to use um, CSS. It's called Cascading Style Sheets, and uh, uh, they're pretty powerful. Even if you don't know a lot about uh, HTML coding, there's some pretty cool things we can do. I'm going to show you how to embed a YouTube video. So let's go to YouTube. Let's look at, you know, go cute puppies. And here's a cute, adorable puppy. Let's share and click on embed. Yeah, you're cute. Okay. Click on embed. I'm going to select this text that appears, copy it to my clipboard. I come back here to my editing view, paste that, and now when we view this page, we will have a video of an adorable cute puppy. If I want to embed an image from online, well, let's Let's uh, find a picture of a cute puppy. There's a cute puppy. View that image. I'm going to get that URL, copy paste it into my clipboard, back over here, and the code for that is angle bracket IMG for image, SRC for source equals quote. That's the URL that I copied, and then slash close quote, okay? So this picture should now appear. There we go, and he's way too big. So let's, instead of doing that, well, here's another little trick we can do. We can do width equals quote 100% close quote. And that will make sure that the adorable puppy does not fill up too much of the page. There we go. Okay. Now, a couple things to know about this is, although Twine does allow you to export all of your web text into a single file, your reader would need a connection to the internet in order to play videos and images that you embed. There are ways that you can make sure to package your own original videos and images and sound effects and so forth along with your Twine file, but I'm not covering that in this tutorial. We can, we can wait on that. Okay, next, I want to introduce you to dynamic text and... Let's bring this guy down here. Let's give you an example of what I mean. Now, normally, when you click a link, we expect. Let's do this. We'll do this. Um, the home link. Uh, I'll do a dynamic. A couple dynamic text examples. Give it a second level heading. Um, Basic link loads a new page. I don't even think I need to demonstrate that. You'll know what that means. But let's also uh, observe that. Sometimes you might want a link to add text to the page. And here's what you do. Open parenthesis, click, colon, add and it's this word add that I'm using. How about let's make this more obvious. Let's make it add text. Okay? I'm going to turn the words add text into a link. And when I click on them, what's going to happen is this. This other text that I'm about to type that's closed off by square brackets will appear. This can help you paste 
help help the reader. Help the reader set the pace for encountering new information. And let's see what that looks like. Okay, so we know what that's going to do. It takes us home. We can go back that way. But if we want to add text to the page, clicking on that text, add text, will add this. This can help the reader set the pace for encountering new information. So, oops, that's not the one I wanted. So that's what we did there. I'm going to come up with another example. Let's say that let's make that an embedded link to the word home. Again, if you're telling a creative story, you probably don't want to send the reader to the actual starting page of your story every time, but um, uh, I'm just I'm kind of playing with it. Well, let's take a look and see what that looks like. Well, there we have. Here we have um, uh, three bits of detail. This responds to the term project. This responds. Oh, typic. <laughs> this responds to the topic, and this responds to meaning. Well, let's make that more explicit. First of all, I'll change that to topic. And now I'm going to make a very explicit connection between the phrase term project. I'm not going to use double brackets, just a single bracket. Term project. I'm going to do this. I'm going to say click colon. I'm going to give this a name. I'm going to call it link one. We end that with a close parenthesis. Put square brackets around that, square brackets around that. And then I'm going to tie this to link one with that bracket and then a bar. Okay. So up here, this click followed right on here. I used those words add text. Here I've tied this term project a, a little bit differently. It'll make sense in a little bit when you see me do it with a couple other um, bits of text, but let's try it for now. And here we have the term project on an obscure topic instills you with meaning. Now, hmm, there's a blank here. I click on term project and now that impressive piece of work, impressive piece of work chunk appears. So let's go back over here and let's also hide these next two chunks of text. Call this one link two. I could call it anything. I just happen to be calling it link two. We'll set the brackets around it the same way. Okay, now notice that inside these single square brackets, we have a link double square brackets. Okay, so um, these are nested brackets. This nesting stuff can drive a person crazy. It's very, very important to make sure that every time you have an open parenthesis, the closed parenthesis is in the right position and that you're not typing the wrong kind of brace curly or square or angle to the wrong number of braces. It can be really fiddly. But that kind of attention to detail is actually its actually a very marketable skill to be able to train yourself to pay attention to what you write at this level. Okay, so let's make obscure topic fire off link two, remember that vertical bar, and meaning will be connected to link three. And again, we need the vertical bar. So let's try it now. Ah. Okay, there's a typo. Okay, so let's let's go back here. I typed there. Look at it was even highlighted for me. How nice of it. And I ignored it. Much better. Okay. 
I just gave a little mini lecture about how attention to detail matters. And while I was giving that lecture, irony of ironies, uh, I had made a typographical error. Um, uh, that just goes to show you that uh, uh, this attention to detail is challenging. It's difficult, but the end results are really very powerful because um, if you type in the code the proper way and you understand what you're doing, uh, the end result can be very effective. So let's again, let's go back here and take a look at it. Now we do not see that error. And we click on term project. Uh, this way, the reader would be very clear to recognize that when you click on term project, that text is related to what you just did there. You click on that, the text changes, and that new information relates to obscure topic and meaning. Perhaps now you can go home. And again, that is a way, you know, we could, for instance, uh, trap the reader. Let's imagine that we get rid of that home link. Let's imagine that we've trapped our game player uh, on this page. They can't leave until they've clicked all these things and they found, aha, okay, well, there, that one contains a link that sends you home. Okay, so that could be a way that uh, you could embed a hidden link in a conversation topic uh, with uh, with a, with an NPC in your game, with a non-player character, you know, another person that your uh, reader is interacting with. Let's take a look now at one more, um, one more change. Now, here when we do it this way, if I do this a little bit out of order, and let's say I click on meaning first, now we have all this blank space and click on term project. Uh, obscure topic will always appear in between these two chunks of text, but we're kind of filling in space a little bit awkwardly. Uh, Twine has a way that allows you to kind of smooth that out. All I have to do is in enclose this area in curly braces. And now when we go to run this document. Basically the same thing happens, but when I click on the word meaning, well, let's do the middle. I click on the second topic and that passage appears in there. Meaning now appears right after that. Term project inserts itself right before it. Uh, if you're being really very picky, notice that there's this, uh, you know, we don't have sentence breaks between these. So you might want to come in here and uh, add a little period there so that now when we go into this and look at it again, when that second explanatory paragraph appears, now we don't have the period and the next sentence jamming up against each other. And if you wanted, we could even close up this gap too. Let's try closing up that gap. Let's move this brace from here to here and Let's also see. I wonder, am I going to be able to get that blank space there? Hmm. I wonder if it's going to take that blank space or not. Let's see. So now, meaning should appear right at the end of that. Okay, and yeah, there isn't a blank space there. So what we can do there is we can add, let's put the blank space at the beginning of every sentence rather than at the end. Let's try that again. So as you can see, there's a lot of sort of trial and error and experimentation. Uh, one of the things that I really want my students to learn anytime they take a programming or a design class or do any kind of project like this is recognize how frequently you will have to try something, tweak it, and try again. This is very, very different from you have an assignment to write 200 words, and once you hit 200 words, you push submit. Uh, for an interactive document, you really have to, to uh, uh, keep working at it and keep adjusting it. You're not doing anything wrong if it takes you a long time to write a brief passage of text. Uh, uh, think how long it took you to read and write in the first place when you were a kid. Uh, I'm asking you to do something that for many of you will be very new. So I'm not expecting you to, to uh, be an expert at it and to rush. And as you can see, I'm making mistakes too as I work on this. So anyway, so let's see. There's that middle sentence. The spacing looks nice. Term project, that should appear in there. Again, the spacing is nice. So uh, there we go. Um, there was nothing wrong with the previous version where each of these things appeared on a separate line. Let's go just remember what it looked like before the the brackets or the, the curly braces. There was nothing wrong with this. It's just I thought that this version 
uh, with the curly braces around it, and then nicely uh, paying attention to the special spaces. Um, uh, the even spacing between sentences really matters. Okay, so that's dynamic text. The next point I want to cover, and we're almost done, is uh, conditional text. And I'll go in here, I'll do conditional text. Now, uh, if your player makes a choice early in the game, you want your game to remember that choice and deliver a different story later on. Not just to the next page, but much later. Um, and here's what I mean. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, conditions. Okay, uh, we will use history to conceal and reveal choices. Okay, you see a safe. We make that a link. We're going to say a page that lets you know the safe is locked. So let's see how that looks like. Let's see what that looks like. Gravity. Safe? Well, no, I've said it's a locked safe. I need to say, you know. Even though uh, this passage is called locked safe, when I view it, there's nothing on it. So we got to call it and you know, say. Okay, safe is locked. So let's play it this way. Now, you see a safe, click on it, oh, the safe is locked. Curses! Lord Ventpooler's papers are secure. Well, again, you probably wouldn't want to let your player just undo it and go back again. So what you'd want to do is something like this. You'd want to uh, have a, let's call this, call this drawing room, we'll call this, you know, Then poor study, and you see a safe, and we'll go back to then poor study. There we go. You better not leave then poor study without the incriminating documents. Now, you know, then poor apostrophe s. I wonder if it'll take the apostrophe s. Let's try. Let's see, sometimes these games get tricky about punctuation. And let's see, did it take it? Yeah, it took the apostrophe without any trouble. All right. So here we go. Let's see, safe. You better not leave then poor study without the incriminating documents. And. It says conditions. Well, let's be sensible about this, and let's instead of calling it conditions, we'll call it, you know, event poor study. Again, it says it up here, but the reader doesn't see it unless we. There we go. Okay. Um. Something glistens under the couch. Well. You find a key. This will send us back to back to Ventpour study. Right? 
about it. All right, so let's see how that goes. Then for study, you see a safe. Nope. Better not leave in for study without the criminating documents. Let's look under the couch. Something glistens under the couch. You find a key. I go back to Ventpour's study, and of course you would figure now, when I click on the safe, I ought to be able to open it. Okay, well let's figure that out. Um, we need to have a... Let's just do it this way. We'll start a passage. Call it this way. Now we'll call it... Safe swings open. All right. So now, how do we get to the opened safe? Well, here's what I need to do. I need to do this. I need to have here, you see a safe, you see a locked safe. Now, we'll only be able to open the safe if we have been to this passage under the couch. So, here's the code that we want to do. We want to have... that called that was called open to safe we want to take we want to take the reader to the opened safe if the reader has already visited the passage under the couch and here's the code that we need to do that If colon history colon parenthesis contains under the couch two close parentheses, then what we're going to show is. this text. Else. Okay. This is not going to work. It's not going to help us do anything, but if this works properly, it'll show you what I'm trying to do. So let's try that. Okay. It says the safe is locked. You see a safe. Go to the safe. Back to Ventpour study. The safe is locked. Now let's look under the couch. You find a key. Ventpour study. Now the safe is now unlocked. Okay. Now I have not changed this link. This link still takes me to the locked safe. So here's what we're going to do. Instead of this there's a stray parenthesis there. Instead of this, the safe is now unlocked, the safe is locked. We're going to do this. We're going to say, if you have not been under the couch, we're going to have this passage, something glistens under the couch displayed. Okay. If history does contain under the couch, then what we want it to say is... you see the open safe. And that should take us to the, what I call it, call it the opened safe. Yeah, okay, you can forget that. I had a malformed link. It's called the opened safe. Not the safe safe. There we go. 
and I want okay well I want to fix the formatting but you'll see yeah I'll just run this and you, I'll sh show you more of the work okay something glistens under the couch you see a safe now this is bad because what we really want is for the player to check the safe first and then notice under the couch. It would be boring to have this under the couch first because people would first look under the couch, then they'd find the key, and then they would have the unlocked safe. Now we got some formatting, got an ex two extra safe here. It's all kind of baffled and bamfoozled around here, and we'll sort it all out. So we what we need to do is this. We need to have... Uh, yeah, we don't need this. The safe is now unlocked. That was just stupid. I shouldn't have typed that there at all. There we go. That's what I need. If we've been under the couch, we still want it to say you see a safe. And if we have not been under the couch, we want this part. You see a locked safe. And then we'll have a little space and something listens under the couch. So... If the default, the first time, before the reader has visited on the under the couch passage, it's going to display, you see a locked safe, something glistens under the couch. And let's take a look at how that goes. Let's see if that works. Okay, you see a safe, something glistens under the couch. I click safe, the safe is locked. Let's go back to vent poor study. Now let's go under the couch, I find a key, and now even though this looks the same, notice the link is blue and not purple. We're kind of giving away to the reader that we haven't been there before. Aha, the safe swings open. You can now escape with the incriminating papers you have won. All right, so that's just a little bit of conditional text, dynamic text, where uh, based on what the player has done previously, things can change. And... Uh, I'm hoping that my tutorial was enough for you to get uh, your head around what Twine is for and what you can do with it. Um, and what Twine is for and what you can do with it. At this point, all I'm interested in is seeing your ability to engage and practice and explore and see what you can do. At a later point, I'll have some more specific goals in mind, but for now, I just want you to experiment with Twine. That's all. Have fun.